one of the things that I have not done for you, I haven't given it to you, I guess you'll have to come to Kingston for it because first of all, I didn't think we would have enough time. But I'd be glad to talk with you a little bit about musical interpretation. We love to analyze and we have developed a seven step process for musical interpretation. Because it was one of those situations again where I'm was sitting thing after Carol and I had been talking a lot about various things and I went away from that particular discussion and started to think to myself, well now what is it that happens in an absolutely fabulous performance? What are the aspects of that playing that make it magical and make other playing just okay and sort of ordinary? So one of the things I realized, I'm going to share something with you that I didn't, didn't put in this, but I, I think it's so wonderful. It's what I call my party trick, because it is so valuable. The first step we have to have, when you hear a beautiful interpretation, that person knows how to create a singing tone. The second thing that whoever is playing knows how to do is balance between the hands. Now balancing between the hands is not a simple process. It is after I share what I do with you, you will think, how can, how can we have gone through life and not known this? I didn't know it myself. It was again one of those teaching things that just provided the creative impulse for it. Because I used to spend hours as a student, as a graduate student, trying to keep the left hand soft. Because I knew balancing was important. It wasn't I didn't know about it. I just couldn't make it happen. And I remember struggling and struggling with a um, D flat major nocturne of Chopin, which has a wonderful bass line. And it's always the left hands of Chopin that are the big challenge mm -hmm. of learning. It's not the melody. We can all remember the melody. We can play the socks off that. It's getting that left hand to be okay underneath it. So here I am, concentrating and trying hard, right? So I'm gonna get this if it kills me. Hours. If I try a little harder, it's gonna be easier this time. Well, I would just, tie myself completely into knots trying to get that right. Down in Emporia, Kansas teaching, and this young woman brings um, the minute waltz to play. You can imagine what that's going to sound like. <laughs> This is just, you know, <laughs> we need something a little better here. So I think to myself, you know, her head, left hand sounds so heavy. If only the left hand could be a little lighter, sound like a feather. Ding. Okay. So I say to her, supposing you didn't have fingers on your left hand, supposing you only had feathers, how loud do you think a feather could play? Well, a feather can't play loud, couldn't play loud, so it plays softly. So if it's, if it's a feather, it's going to play very lightly. There it was. It was like, like magic. Literally like magic. And this left hand was just gorgeous. And now I've even sort of refined it a little bit so that when I'm talking to the students about playing, or anybody about playing lightly, you know that if a feather lands, it lands really lightly. No matter how fast or hard the wind may blow it, it still lands lightly because it's only a feather. So it can move very fast, but it never lands hard. So your hand is moving fast, but you play lightly and softly. Fast movement, light, light, light. No matter how fast you move, it is light because you have time to play it lightly. It's so beautiful, so rewarding to hear it. 
and then the right hand. Now we want the right hand to be singing out. So we imagine that the energy is melting past the elbow, the, the shoulder, melt, and I use the word advisedly because we know that our language can solve the problem for us or create more. So like neuro-linguistic programming, I'm going to give you an example of neuro-linguistic programming. Don't think of elephants. <laughs> <laughs> Every one of you had a picture of an elephant, right? <laughs> because in order for the brain not to think of it, first it has to think of it and then put a cross through it. So it's been an old adage in teaching forever. What you don't want to bring about, you don't speak about. And that was how it was phrased to me. So if we don't want the children to be doing something, and in this case, we don't want them to have tension in their shoulders. We don't want tension. That, that word, I can hardly speak it. I have expunged that word from my vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So instead, I talk about energy melting past the shoulder. So their shoulder is free. Because it's, if it's melted, it can't do anything, right? It melts past the elbow. It melts past the wrist. Now, wave goodbye like a like a baby, you know, I'm just flopping that wrist around, and it pools in the fingertips. Now, if you feel that energy pooling in the fingertip and you let your arm hang, every one of you should have that sense of all that blood just rushing down to your fingertips and pooling there. So now, when you want to play, you don't have to ask your hands to work at all. The fact is, those fingers are going to be so heavy that the tone is going to be big. And it's just, it's so easy. So now I have this vision of my students walking around the world. <laughs> looking like that. Because <laughs> their left hand is floating off into space and the right hand is just being so dragged down with that heavy lead. Now here's, the, here's another magical part of this whole thing that I get so excited about. If you can do that with the right hand heavy as lead and the left hand feathers, you can reverse it. Because when you play Happy Farmer, 